In the early 2010s, creepypastas rose to prominence. At the time, it seemed like everywhere you turned online, you were met with horror stories telling the tales of psycho serial killers, disturbing human experiments, and murderous supernatural beings. Creepypasta urban legends like Slender Man, Ben Drowned, and Jeff the Killer were terrifying people around the world, and fictional horror was experiencing a digital renaissance. Many creepypastas appealed to children, and generally most kids innocuously consumed this horror content. But in a small handful of cases, there have been instances where children developed bizarre fixations with these horror stories. And aside from kids, some adult criminals have eerily mimicked foul deeds perpetrated within creepypasta stories. From a 12-year-old girl stabbed as a tribute to Slender Man, to a girl killing her mother to appease a supernatural clown, to a real-life murder case sharing eerily similar elements to a famous creepypasta, these are the crimes inspired by creepypasta. Howdy. I'm here to talk about your rights and today's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan. Several years ago, I had a friend who ordered a fast food chicken sandwich and discovered it had a thumbtack in it. I remember when it happened, he floated around the idea of pursuing damages, but found the process of hiring a lawyer too intimidating and complicated. He never did anything about it. Well, that's where today's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan, comes in. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm with over 800 attorneys operating in all 50 states. With Morgan, you can skip the tedious law office visits and get legal representation with just a few clicks on your phone. It's completely hassle-free, and if you feel like you have a claim, there's nothing to lose by submitting it to Morgan. You don't pay a dime unless they win the case. Don't be like my chicken sandwich friend. Don't allow yourself to be violated by thumbtacks and rogue office supplies. Protect your rights with the largest injury law firm in America, Morgan & Morgan. If you've ever been injured in an accident, you can submit a claim at www.forthepeople.com slash wavywebsurf or by dialing pound law. That's pound 529 on your phone. Big thanks to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring. Now let's get on to the story. While many creepypasta-influenced crimes have been inspired by the story of Slender Man, there is one creepypasta killing that's often overlooked and, in my view, might be the most disturbing of them all. It's the child killer inspired by Laughing Jack. The legend of Laughing Jack is a creepypasta tale almost as old as the art form itself. A dark clown with sinister intent, Jack is said to approach children in an ethereal state, masquerading as what some might describe as an imaginary friend. Friend. Once the child trusts this insidious being, that's when it strikes, unleashing psychological horrors and eventually physically manifesting and murdering its child victim. The original Laughing Jack stories were written by a deviant art user known as Snuffbomb. The story was published to the site on March 3rd of 2013. In the story, Jack is described as, quote, a clown with long hair, a big swirly cone nose. He's got long arms and baggy pants with stripy socks and he always smiles. Snuffbomb would also go on to upload various cosplay photos and art of the newly created character, which helped showcase the vision that he had for the creepypasta creature. The Laughing Jack story would become a creepypasta hit, so popular that Snuff would go on to write a prequel expounding on the origins of the character. These stories describe Jack's origins as being that of a Victorian era jack-in-the-box toy that possessed supernatural powers. While initially a benevolent entity, Jack would become cursed after its first human child companion grew up to become a vicious serial killer. Apparently doomed to emulate the behavior of its owners, Jack would then under go a harrowing transformation, becoming the malevolent Laughing Jack and commit killings of its own, the seemingly immortal being hunting children to this very day. It's a simplistic, almost tropish horror tale that we've heard variations of throughout the years. I mean, the IT influence is all over the place here. But Laughing Jack would resonate with an entirely new generation of horror fans, similar to how supernatural movie killers like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees captured the imagination of youths in the 80s, early 2010s online creepypastas like Laughing Jack were terrifying millennials and Gen Zers around the world. It was a darkly magical moment in internet culture, and some got whipped up into a frenzy. Sadly, for younger folks, it was often difficult for them to differentiate fact and fiction. 
and this becomes problematic when creepypastas are intentionally written in a way that makes them seem real. And when a young child genuinely believes that a supernatural being is out to kill them, well, nothing good comes out of that. Which brings us to the tragic killing of Maria Torres. This is Maria Torres. At the time of this story taking place in 2015, Maria was a 50-year-old woman from Elkhart, Indiana. Maria spent much of her time raising her 12-year-old stepdaughter, who we'll refer to as JT. They, together with Father Edwin Torres, lived in a small apartment building in Elkhart. The family didn't have much in terms of financial resources, and it's been said that raising JT was quite the struggle. JT reportedly experienced a traumatic and abusive early childhood and suffered from PTSD and emotional issues. These problems manifested themselves in bouts of extreme fear, paranoia, and difficulty socializing. Maria's stepdaughter's mental issues would only be exacerbated after she got heavily involved into online creepypasta communities. Online, JT would become immersed within the world of creepypasta lore and spent much of her free time consuming stories and online urban legends about mysterious creatures and supernatural killers. One story that JT particularly became obsessed with was the tale of Laughing Jack. JT was enthralled by the myth. Disturbed yet intrigued by the story's implications and titular character, the young girl began to believe that the monster described in the online story may have in fact been real. While Laughing Jack is first and foremost a killer, the character has often been described in writings as charismatic, charming, and quick-witted. And JT was said to have been somewhat attracted to this being's devious combination of traits. Fully immersed into the gruesome world of Laughing Jack, in some way you could say that JT was possessed by the creature, or at least convinced herself that she was. Reports say that around this time, the 12-year-old claimed to have been hearing voices from the cackling clown. It's alleged that on one occasion, the delusional child begged her father to help her stop these voices, but the man apparently had no solution. With this girl apparently living in a fantasy creepypasta world and hearing voices urging her to kill, it was only a matter of time before the impressionable 12-year-old would make an ill-advised decision. Heavily under the influence of the creepypasta, the mentally unwell girl eventually began plotting to murder her own family to appease these voices. In preparation for this heinous deed, she reportedly searched online how to hide from the police, make poison, sharpen knives, and how to hide in the woods. She would also reportedly watch a video of a stabbing and would frequently listen to Pop Goes the Weasel, the song that the souls of Jack's murdered victims are subjected to hearing on repeat in a hellish afterlife. And then the night of her heinous deed would come. On the night of July 23rd, 2015, JT would send a text message to her friend, requesting to meet up with them later in the evening at 10 p.m. In this correspondence, she reportedly texted in capital letters that she wanted to leave and that she could not take it anymore. She also reportedly stated in the text that she was going to snap. After scheduling this dubious meeting, JT would then join her family for dinner and to watch television with them. During this family time, JT would reportedly express bizarre behavior. She was said to have flashed a wicked grin at her parents, showing her teeth on multiple occasions. JT was also said to have been seen standing in a strange, hunched, ghoulish posture. But when asked if something was wrong, she would simply reply that everything was fine. It seemed like the family knew something was up, but eventually everybody would go to bed. But the family's sleep wouldn't last long, as they would soon be awoken and have to face a horrifying scene. Later in the evening, Edwin and Maria would be awakened in the middle of the night by a loud noise. As they came to their senses, they immediately smelled smoke. The smoke was coming from JT's room. Maria would go investigate. And as she opened JT's door, she was blasted with a cloud of smoke and met with a chilling sight. It's been reported that Maria found JT ominously standing in the middle of her room, shrouded in a cloud of smoke. Maria would call out to her stepdaughter, but JT wouldn't answer. The father would then enter the room and soon found that a portion of the bedroom floor was on fire and that the girl's closet had been set ablaze. As Edwin tried to put out the fire, Maria would take JT into the hallway. While escorting 
telling the girl it was at this moment that Maria noticed that JT was wielding a knife. The woman let out a scream, and Edwin would immediately come to see why his wife was screaming, but he was moments too late. JT had allegedly stabbed her stepmother, an assault that would later turn fatal. Edwin was met with the visage of his fatally wounded wife and his daughter who was standing with a hunched posture. It's been said that throughout all this, JT was speaking in a terrifying grating and high-pitched voice, almost as if she was possessed by a demon. Despite the attack on his wife, Edwin attempted to save his daughter from the burning building. He pled with JT to follow him out. She reportedly ordered him to stay back and allegedly attacked him, slicing the man's arm up with the knife. Edwin was able to wrestle the girl off of him and disarmed her. He then picked her up and took her out of the home, his arm bleeding heavily. Police and firefighters would arrive shortly after to investigate the scene and put out the blaze. Firefighters discovered that Maria suffered multiple stab wounds to her face and torso. One wound was over three inches deep. She was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. Now, during all this commotion, JT actually managed to flee the scene and ran off into the woods. After fleeing, she would meet up with the friend that she had previously texted, and the two began walking the wilderness using railroads until they discovered a house. There, they would knock on the door of this home and interact with the property's resident, a local man named Zachary Sleeper. Naturally, the guy was extremely confused at the presence of these two girls at his door and he started questioning them. The man asked why they had come and what they were doing out at night. It's said that in response, JT and her friend attempted to spin a ruse suggesting that they had been hiking and had run out of food. Mr. Sleeper found their story suspicious and knew something was up. It was at this point that the man invited the two disheveled girls inside and went into another room pretending to prepare a meal for them. However, what he was actually doing was calling the police to his house. A short time later, cops would arrive and it would be at this moment that JT was identified and connected as being the at-large killer. The girls were then detained and taken into custody. Upon being arrested, it was noted that the girls were carrying backpacks. One of the bags contained a pair of blood-stained pants it was clear they had found who they were looking for. Being too young, JT couldn't be arrested as an adult and was instead passed over to juvenile authorities for a mental evaluation. After an evaluation by multiple doctors, it was determined that the young girl wasn't mentally fit to stand trial and she was subsequently diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder. What exactly happened to JT after her arrest is very difficult to ascertain and almost every sort of proceeding pertaining to her has been been sealed, but there are some tidbits of information that we know about JT in light of this arrest. It's said that after the killing of Maria, JT has been refused by 16 psychiatric facilities. So with this context, it appears that the state is trying to get her in a psychiatric facility instead of having to take her to trial and potentially send her to prison. But apparently this has proved quite difficult, I guess because of the extreme nature of her psychiatric component. Unable to get into a psychiatric facility, JT was made to stay in a juvenile detention center, apparently having to do so for a couple of years. Finally, in September of 2017, JT was deemed fit to stand trial and juvenile court would allow the case to proceed in January of 2018. Prosecutors would attempt to have JT's case transferred to an adult court. However, apparently efforts to do so have failed. Given the sealed nature of this juvenile case, the outcome of JT's trial is unknown. This case is an absolute tragedy and goes down as one of the most disturbing incidents of a creepypasta indirectly contributing to the deterioration of a child's mental state ending in tragic consequences. Next, we'll dive into a disturbing creepypasta that got popular on Reddit. And several years after its popularity, a crime was committed that shared very similar plot elements to this creepypasta. This is the story of a dead man sending messages from his Facebook. This story all begins on the No Sleep subreddit. R slash No Sleep is a subreddit where anonymous internet users congregate to tell unsettling stories. Stories submitted to R slash No Sleep are presumed to be fiction. But every now and then, a user creates a thread to the subreddit that leaves readers terrified for the poster and their safety. 
One such post that yielded this sort of reaction was submitted to the subreddit in 2014. The title of this now infamous thread was, My dead girlfriend keeps messaging me on Facebook. I got the screenshots, I don't know what to do. The post was submitted by Redditor Nate SW, who also went by the name Nathan. In his thread, the concerned poster would detail a disturbing encounter that he experienced on Facebook. This encounter involving his dead ex-girlfriend who had somewhat recently passed away in a car accident? Well, her Facebook account was sending him bizarre messages. He shares screenshots as proof of this. Emily, his deceased girlfriend, says, Hello? Nathan says, Who is this? It's really weird receiving messages from Emily's account. The Emily account says, Hello? Nathan says, Susan, you're on Emily's account? Susan, the woman Nathan referring to here is Emily's mother, and the only people that had access to Emily's Facebook accounts were Nathan and Susan. And Nathan, after seeing this, would promptly message and communicate with Susan that Emily's account was posting, and she would say that she wasn't the person sending the messages. After finding this out, Nathan began to panic a bit, as even more bizarre activities started coming from Emily's account. Emily's account began tagging itself in pictures and leaving additional cryptic messages. Nathan says, Why are you doing this? Why do you keep tagging her? The count eerily replies numerous times, saying, Hello. 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 Nathan, now distraught, says, This is actually devastating. I don't know why you enjoy doing this. The Emily account mocks Nathan, saying, Why are you doing this? The account of the deceased girl would continue spouting off gibberish, repeating Nathan's name over and over again. At this point, completely freaked out, Nathan would decide to change the login information on Emily's account in the hopes that if this was a hacker, it would kick them off. But despite the password change, the messages apparently still continued and became more aggressive. And eventually, Nathan claimed to have been sent this disturbing image. It was a picture taken by someone outside of his residence. This unknown entity apparently taking a photo through his window at the computer set up that he used to browse the internet. Nathan says, that's my door. That's my computer. It's taken from outside. I got the message three hours ago, but I didn't check it until now. I'm on my tablet in my garage. Zen for now. I'm going to drive to a friend's. Forgot to open the garage door in my panic, so building up the nerve to get out and do that now. And after this post detailing that there was apparently a stalker outside of his home that had somehow gotten access to his dead girlfriend's Facebook account, Nate would stop updating the no sleep thread. This thread would end up becoming one of the most popular stories on no sleep, and it's most certainly a work of fiction. But that being said, the story of someone hacking Nate's dead girlfriend's account captured the imagination of the internet. While Nathan's story was nothing more than a well-executed creepypasta, you might be surprised to find that there has been an extremely disturbing case of a deceased individual's Facebook page coming back to life. Which brings us to the almost creepypasta-like real-life kidnapping and murder of Kayla Brown and Charles Carver. In South Carolina, on August 31st of 2016, two years after Nathan's creepypasta had been published to Reddit, 30-year-old Kayla Brown Brown and her boyfriend, 32-year-old Charles David Carver, went missing. This couple had disappeared after they went to remove brush from a piece of property belonging to a local man named Todd Colip. Colip was a successful realtor in the area. Apparently, Kayla and Charles had agreed to do a bit of work for him. It's said that Kayla and Charles had made plans to meet up with some friends and eat dinner after they performed this work but they never showed up to the dinner and friends became suspicious. Unfortunately though, the friends weren't aware of the sort of work or who they were working for. So they really had no idea where or what Charles and Kayla had been doing earlier in the day. After some time, the couple was reported as missing and authorities began trying to find leads regarding their whereabouts. But then something strange happens. One of the missing, Charles Carver, well, his Facebook account begins to post messages and comments to friends on social media. Many of these comments addressing the concerns expressed by his friends and family on Facebook about his whereabouts. These comments seemingly authored by a third person, not Charles or Kayla. Where the hell is Kayla Brown? Kayla is with her husband, Charlie. Why can't she have any contact with us? And who is this? 
she doesn't want to. I don't believe that. I know Kayla. She's not going to just run away from everyone. You or her should at least let someone know she's alive. The people that need to know that we are okay know that. Charlie's account also says, I have every right to post whatever I want to post. I know both Charlie and Kayla very well. Charlie and Kayla both lived with me. Charlie's account would go on to post additional cryptic messages. Sometimes late at night, I dig a hole in the backyard to keep the nosy neighbors guessing. The account even quotes lyrics from Hotel California. Last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax, said the night man. We are programmed to receive. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. There was no clear-cut answer on who was behind these unsettling postings, but it was pretty obvious that it wasn't Charles himself. Naturally, friends and family were extremely concerned for the safety of Charles and Kayla at this point as it appeared like something may have been terribly wrong. Eventually, police would discover the bit of information regarding Kayla and Charles doing work for a man named Todd Kolip. Upon learning this, they immediately considered the man a person of interest. Kolip had a criminal record and had been previously convicted for serious crimes including kidnapping. The police raided his property, and it's here that they would find the horrific answer to the question of what happened to Charles and Kayla. On November 3rd of 2016, police would discover Kayla Brown chained up to a wall in a storage container on Todd's property. Kayla was alive and had been repeatedly sexually assaulted. It's been reported that she was kept in this state for a period of two months. Watch out, y'all move. Just a girl, just a girl. How are you, honey? This We're is bolt cutters. This is our best friend. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't have I got it right here. At some point during the kidnapping, Charles Carver had been shot and killed by Todd Kolip. His body was found buried amongst several other human remains on the apparent serial killer's property. Todd Kolip would be arrested shortly after Kayla Brown's rescue and reportedly confessed to the killings and kidnappings. The man would additionally confess to an unsolved quadruple homicide committed in 2003, where Kolip allegedly shot four people at a super bike motorsports shop in South Carolina. On May 26th, of 2017, Todd would plead guilty to seven counts of murder and two counts of kidnapping and one count of criminal sexual assault. The heartless killer was sentenced to serve seven consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Kayla Brown would also later sue Todd Kolib for damages. She would be awarded $6.3 million as a result of this lawsuit. As you might expect, we can't have a crimes influenced by creepy pasta video without discussing Slenderman, as there have been at least two brutal attacks inspired by this monster. Slenderman is hands down the most infamous figure to come out of the creepy pasta genre. The origins of Slenderman date all the way back to the Something Awful forums in 2009. At the time, the website was hosting a paranormal Photoshop contest. It would be during this competition that these uncanny images were created. Created, images that would later be used as the basis of Slenderman lore as written by various creepypasta writers later in the early 2010s. Slenderman is a ghastly otherworldly creature often found skulking about in the fringes of areas where children play. Slenderman is often depicted as tall, thin, and emotionless, his clothing black and face white. Most of the time, the creature appears in a suit and tie, which apparently hide a set of tentacles that the monster uses to restrain and strangulate its victims. Slenderman's motive is to kill humans, and it prefers to target children as they're easier to manipulate. Slenderman in many ways is the face of creepypasta, and its notoriety almost single-handedly brought the genre to prominence in 2012. And if you remember, there was a bit of mania surrounding this monster, like some people actually believed that it was real. 
This certainly was the case for younger people who encountered the Slender Man story online. While the youth's obsession with this murderous creature proved harmless for most, there have been a couple of documented cases where a Slender Man obsession led to brutal attacks. Which brings us to the infamous story of the Slender Man stabbings, also known as the Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire case. Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser, both 12 years old at the time of this story taking place were middle schoolers hailing from Wakosha, Wisconsin. Anissa was quite shy, was never in trouble, and was considered a teacher's pet, often snitching on other kids who were doing wrong in her classes. By all means, the girl was a complete do-gooder. Morgan, on the other hand, showed red flags in her childhood that sort of indicated that she may have had somewhat of a troubling future. As a child, Morgan experienced many hallucinations and would talk to herself often. Some hallucinations included a smoky figure that she had nicknamed It. Morgan's parents have also cited that they at times felt that their daughter had lack of empathy. For instance, they recall that when their daughter first watched the movie Bambi, she didn't show any emotional reaction to the scene where Bambi's mother dies which as a little girl, it's a pretty tough one to get through. As a young girl, Morgan didn't have many friends and would often sit alone at school. Morgan would meet one of her first close friends in the fourth grade, a young girl named Peyton Lutner. The story goes that Peyton had noticed Morgan sitting alone at school and decided to befriend her. This decision to befriend Morgan would be one that Peyton would later regret, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. In addition to Morgan being pretty shy and really only having one friend in the form of Peyton, she also behaved very bizarrely during her school age years and performed weird rituals that alienated her from other people. For example, at one point, a group of teenagers found Morgan playing with her own blood in the school bathroom and reported it to a teacher. Morgan was also suspended from school at one point for sneaking a hammer onto the premises. Peyton's family would also notice strange behavior from Morgan when the two would hang out. Peyton's parents stating that during a sleepover, they had caught Morgan burning paper in their basement. Because of this bizarre activity, Peyton's family would urge the girl to sort of distance herself from Morgan and their friendship fizzled out. With this friendship now on the back burner, Morgan would make new friends with another girl named Anissa Wire. These two met in October of 2013 while riding the bus together. Like Morgan, Anissa has been described as somewhat of a social outcast and the two individuals clicked, both sharing weird and bizarre interests. One such bizarre interest being that of creepypastas and Slenderman. At some point, Anissa and Morgan became infatuated with the Slenderman character. Anissa first hearing about the mythical monster after watching a Sky Does Minecraft YouTube video about it. So, when, how did you learn about Slender and Creepypasta? Um, I first heard about it on YouTube. I was watching a Minecraft mod showcase by Sky. Uh, okay, Sky does Minecraft or something. Okay. And it said it, he, it was the creepy pasta mod. So I was like, hey, what's a creepy pasta? I watched the whole video and I was like. Oh, that's interesting. The two would completely immerse themselves within Slender Man lore to the point where they almost felt like the creature could have been real. The two have claimed to have experienced hallucinations about Slender Man and would become convinced that he was out to get them. When did you, when was this before the party that you saw yeah. the party? You've seen him before? Twice. Um, once, well, they were both on a bus. We ride the same bus. Just can to from school. So we were uh, like talking on the bus. I look out the window and I see this supposed thing standing like this with tendrils. Looks exactly like a tree. Um, there you go, like that. And not only did these girls feel that Slender Man was real, they apparently became convinced that Slender Man wanted them to join him and kill for him. They wanted to become puppets of this fictional monster. And after just two months of being friends with each other, Anissa and Morgan would make the decision that they were going to sacrifice one of their own friends to Slender Man. Their sacrificial target being someone that Morgan still had contact with, that being 12-year-old Peyton Lutner. 
So Morgan would show a sudden newfound interest in rekindling her former friendship with Peyton. And she started emailing the girl a bunch of creepypasta related stuff to try to, you know, get her invested in creepypasta lore like her and Anissa were. Initially, it seemed that Peyton appreciated the newfound interest in becoming friends. Little did she know that behind the scenes, the two were plotting to attack her. Around this time, Morgan would search up phrases on the internet like how to cover up a murder and what happens if I get caught murdering someone. The girl also furthering her study of Slender Man lore and making sure that the murder was up to his expectation. As you can likely tell by now, Morgan is certainly the more serious and engaged when it comes to this potential killing. And it almost seemed like Anissa was sort of half-heartedly following Morgan on her quest here. As a matter of fact, it's been reported that at one point, Anissa even confided to a friend, revealing that she was going to become a Slender Man proxy by killing someone. The person she told this to never reported it and thought that she was joking. It's almost like Anissa was trying to subconsciously ruin the plot so, you know, they wouldn't have to go through with killing Peyton or trying to kill Peyton. Whatever the case, Morgan's murder murderous master plan would come to fruition on May 31st of 2014. As Anissa, Morgan, and Peyton were all together under the same roof for a sleepover at Morgan's house. After a relatively uneventful night, it would be the following morning that the ball was set in motion. Anissa and Morgan had allegedly made plans to take Peyton out to a remote park and commit the deed and sacrifice to Slenderman there. And with this in mind, the trio would then set out for their day to a wooded area at David's Park. What Peyton didn't realize is that Morgan had tucked a kitchen knife in her bag before they had left the house. Peyton and Anissa would lead Peyton to this park. At this park, there was a bathroom, and the two initially tried to lure Peyton in here to perpetrate the act. Once inside of this bathroom, Morgan started talking to Peyton about various Slender Man lore, and at some point she becomes uncomfortable and decides to leave the bathroom likely suspecting danger or that something was up. Once outside of the bathroom, it was decided by the group that they would all play hide and go seek. And it was during this game of hide and seek that Morgan and Anissa's intentions would finally be revealed. During this game, Morgan and Anissa would jump on Peyton. They pinned down the girl and Morgan would procure the knife that she had taken from her house. Morgan would go on to stab Peyton 19 times in the arms and legs and torso with the five inch long kitchen knife. She was attempting to sacrifice the girl to Slender Man. After this brutal attack, Morgan and Anissa would leave Peyton for dead and leave the park, but these 19 stab wounds hadn't killed the girl. She was hanging on by a thread. Clinging to life, Peyton would bravely drag herself up to a nearby road next to the park. She would then find a highly visible patch of grass where she could lie down, and with a stroke of luck, a passing cyclist spotted her body barely breathing at 9.53 a.m. The cyclist would call 911 immediately. When officers arrived, Peyton was still conscious. They asked who attacked her, to which she replied, my friend Morgan. In the meantime, Anissa and Morgan had fled the scene and were on a self-stated mission to meet Slender Man in the Nicolette National Forest, which was over 200 miles away from the park that they had tried to kill Peyton at. They had kept the weapon that they had used on Peyton in a bag and proceeded to walk 4.9 miles down the road near Interstate 94, stopping at a Walmart to refill some water that they would need for the trip. While Peyton was fighting for her life in a hospital, the authorities put out a wanted post on Facebook with pictures of Morgan and Anissa, and the public was put on notice to be on the lookout for the girls. While walking down the highway, the two would be recognized by a driver, and they were reported to authorities, and Morgan and Anissa would be subsequently apprehended by police at a nearby furniture store. The girls were said to have been covered in blood, and it was pretty obvious they were the ones responsible. While being arrested, Morgan asked one of the officers if she had killed Peyton in a very detached and emotionless manner. And as we now know, she failed as Peyton would survive. While being interrogated, both girls were quite forthcoming in regards to their deeds. Tell me. She always calls her a bitch. Why? I don't know. Because she's being one? I'm just assuming. I don't really know what the definition is. So do you like Bella pretty much? Have you ever been mad at her? 
She was my only friend for a long time because why would you hurt your only friend? It was necessary. It seemed that Morgan in particular felt little empathy while Anissa felt guilty and seemed to communicate shame for her involvement. The whole time people were screaming and begging, saying stuff like, I hate you guys, I'll never forgive you, and I trusted you. She even let out a sigh of relief when she found out that Peyton was alive. Did you think that she died? Yeah. She is alive. Okay. While being interrogated separately, Morgan and Anissa both tried to point to each other as the main culprit for the planning of the attempted murder. Morgan claimed that she was trying to appease Anissa, while Anissa claimed she wanted Morgan's approval. And he just told me we had to. Why? Because she said that he'd kill her family. Drawings of sinister sketches pertaining to Slender Man and other creepypasta characters would be found in Morgan's room, as well as Barbie dolls that had been desecrated with occultish designs. In August of 2014, a judge found Morgan incompetent to stand trial and suspended the prosecution of attempted first-degree intentional homicide. But later, in December of 2014, psychological evaluations performed on both girls indicated that they understood the charges being pressed against them. During a preliminary hearing, it was argued that the girls acted in a kill or be kill type of way, with the argument being that they felt that if they didn't appease Slenderman, they would be murdered. This argument was rejected by a judge after interrogation footage conflicted with it. In July of 2015, it would be found that Morgan, who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia since the time of her arrest, had a genetic predisposition to the mental illness as her father was also diagnosed with the disease and spent his teenage years in and out of the hospital because of it. Morgan would mentally spiral while staying at a juvenile detention center and tried to self-harm. As a result of this, later in January of 2016, a civil judge approved sending Morgan Geyser to a state mental facility where she could be treated for her schizophrenia. Anissa would also be diagnosed with delusional disorder and depression. Soon after, in 2016, it was determined that both of them would be tried as adults and would be facing upwards of 65 years in prison if found guilty. In August of 2017, Anissa pled guilty to the lesser charge of being a party to attempted second degree and intentional homicide, but still underwent trial to determine if her mental illness excused her from being criminally responsible. Anissa was eventually found to be not guilty by mental disease or defect by a jury in September of 2017 and was committed to the maximum length of supervision at the Winnebago Health Institute in December of 2017, where she could possibly stay for 25 years. However, she could see community supervision after only three years served. Morgan avoided adult trial in September of 2017 and expressed how sorry she was after pleading guilty to first degree attempted and intentional homicide. But as a part of a plea agreement, she would not be held criminally liable and would remain in the mental hospital. In February of 2018, she was committed to 40 years of mental health treatment and monitoring. In November of 2020, Anissa petitioned to be released, saying that she will not pose any significant risk of bodily harm to herself and others, and she was re-evaluated by three mental health professionals. And in March of 2021, all three experts determined that Anissa met the standards for her conditional release on July 1st of 2021, and she was released from psychiatric custody later Later in September. The plan is for her to live with her father under constant GPS monitoring. In June of 2023, Morgan Geyser appeared in court in the hopes of seeking the same release that her former friend Anissa received. It's yet to be determined if she will get this conditional release, and in my opinion, I would imagine likely not because, well, she was the one that had the knife and attacked Peyton. It's a tragedy with an aftermath that has lasted many years and has still not been fully resolved. That was the story of what is likely the most infamous creepypasta related case ever, the Slenderman stabbings.
This next creepypasta crime is yet another that involves Slender Man. It's a strange case involving a child assaulting their own mother with a knife. Initially, the motives for this attack baffled authorities, but when writings and online postings created by the child became public, Slender Man appeared to be the motivating factor behind the brutal assault. The names of the 13-year-old daughter and the mother victim in this story aren't publicly known as identifying information about the individuals in this story have been sealed. So for the purpose of this telling, I'll refer to the individuals as the mother and the daughter, respectively. In Cincinnati, Ohio, in late spring of 2014, a mother was caught completely off guard when her own 13-year-old daughter brandished a knife and attacked her. The story goes that the mother had come home to find her daughter holding a knife while menacingly standing in the kitchen, the girl wearing a dark hoodie and a white mask. Moments later, the disturbed daughter then charged her mother, jumping on her and viciously cutting at her neck and face, even at one point plunging the knife into her mother's back. During the stabbing, the daughter allegedly shouting out something about she was role-playing. The mother has said, quote, she was something else during that attack. I got the feeling that she was playing a role. It didn't feel like her at all. Thankfully, the malicious teen would yield in her assault, giving the now badly wounded mother an opportunity to get away and call police. The daughter would later be arrested and taken to Hamilton County Juvenile Detention Center, where she was charged for the assault. Thankfully, the stab wound injuries suffered by the mother were not life-threatening, only being left with the emotional trauma of being brutally assaulted by the very child that she brought into this world. Initially, the attack made little sense and authorities were trying to wrap their head around why a kid would do this. They didn't really understand the motivations. That was until another stabbing case hit the national news headlines that involved a child. Days after this mother and daughter incident, the infamous Wakosha Slenderman stabbings that we discussed in the previous story took place. And when the mother learned about the details of this case and Slenderman, that's when she began to speculate that her own daughter may have also been influenced by this slender man creature we found things that she had written and she made reference to slender man you know she thought back to her daughter wearing the black hoodie and the white mask it was like the same appearance of the slender man creature the mother would then discover additional evidence linking her daughter's attack to a slender man obsession such as writings that she had authored referencing the monstrous character and an entire minecraft server that the kid had dedicated as an effigy to the supernatural monster she also made some references to um, you know, killing. She even had created a, a, a world for Slender Man in Minecraft. And with that being said, it does appear that a creepypasta, you know, Slender Man fixation did have some contributing element to this attack. Since the time of this girl's detainment, information surrounding this case has been sealed, and it's not known if she was ever sentenced or convicted for the alleged stabbing. And her mother has not given any additional comment on case proceedings. Fortunately, unlike the previous cases, no one was seriously injured in this one. And well, you've made it to the end of yet another Wavy Web Surf Halloween special. Let me know what you guys thought about the video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. Big happy Halloween to all of you out there and a major shout to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Have a great night. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.